Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would certainly strive that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from hence. Words from today's gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On this feast day of Christ the King, we can reflect on how our Savior Jesus is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Thus, St. Paul tells us that he is the firstborn of every creature. Firstborn of every creature. And that he is before all. On the Easter Vigil, the blessing for the candle, which symbolizes Christ, reads as follows. Christ yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega, All time belongs to him and all the ages. To him be glory and dominion through every age forever. Amen. His kingship, in other words, is absolute. It's exclusive. It's unlimited over the entire human race, believers and unbelievers alike. Over all the angelic choirs in heaven, as St. Paul indicated in the letter, in his epistle but also of those in hell. The devil cannot do anything without the permission of the king. Do not be misled. All that is happening right now, all that has happened, all that will happen, no matter what it is, has the king's permission or his direct orders, do this. The devil is only God's jailer. Only God's policeman at times. Christ's kingly authority extends over the entire universe without exception for all time. Amen. Now those who submit to this authority of our Lord, of His King, join in His kingdom. They join His kingdom which is the mystical body of Christ, His beloved bride, for whom He laid down His life, for whom the universe was made. She is the body. He is the head, as St. Paul said in the lesson. In this mystical city of God, His servants enter through baptism as through a door to swear fealty to Him, to know Him, to love Him and to adore Him and serve Him with all their mind, heart, soul, and strength. His kingdom is the home of truth and charity, of meekness and humility. It is the hospital for sinners and the home of saints. Even now, part of this mystical body of Christ is utterly triumphant reigning with her most noble king forever in heaven. Thus the words of our Lord today, my kingdom is not of this world. Hmm. Now we, the king's servants and soldiers, the baptized, we're pilgrims, we're strangers and sojourners here on this earth. We have no city here we can call home. Being made in the king's image, even physically, we're made after his image. And we're remade in His likeness by grace, by our baptism. So, we model our lives on His and we live for heaven. Seeking to render unto God what is God's. As members of the church militant, we join in His battles to wage war with those implacable enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil error, vice, and all evil. Is this not what our baptismal vows demand? Rejecting Satan, all his pomps, and the world, all its show? Now, since the King of Kings has ascended into heaven to rule from his starry throne at the right hand of the Father, he left a vicar in his place who is the King of the kings and the Lord of the lords of this earth, a father and general of the church militant. 
This is the sovereign pontiff, the Pope. Listen to the 19th century English oratorian, Father Frederick Faber. He gave a sermon called Devotion to the Pope. Others have written on this. He's just done such a beautiful job that I used him. He says, The Pope is the vicar of Jesus on earth and enjoys among the monarchs of the world all the rights and sovereignties of the sacred humanity of Jesus. Wow! All the rights and sovereignties of Jesus is his sacred humanity. Wow! He says, No crown can be above his crown by divine right. He can be subject to none. All subjection is a violence and a persecution. He is a monarch by the very force of his office. For of all kings, he is the closest to the king of kings. He is the visible shadow cast by the invisible head of the church in the blessed sacrament. He is the visible shadow cast by the invisible head of the church in the blessed sacrament. Thank you, Father Faber. So the papacy is a monarchy with the popes of old being crowned with the papal tiara, the triple crown, the first circlet that symbolizes the pope's universal episcopate. The second, his primacy of jurisdiction. The third, his temporal influence. And as this tiara is placed on the Pope's head at his coronation, these words are said. At least they were because they stopped using it. It's, they used to say, Receive the tiara adorned with three crowns and know that you are father of princes and kings. Guide of the world. Vicar of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this means, with the Pope stands or falls Christianity. Just as a body stands or falls with the head. If it were possible to destroy the papacy, Catholicism would immediately cease to exist. Even if it still numbered millions of members. We are therefore either papal or we are nothing. We are either papal or we are nothing. No wonder St. Ambrose said, Ubi Petrus, Ibi Ecclesia. Where Peter is, there the church is. St. Jerome said, The church is built on this rock, Peter, the papacy. Thus, Father Faber goes on to say, With what carefulness then, with what reverence, with what exceeding loyalty... Ought we not to correspond to so magnificent a grace, to so marvelous a love as this which our dearest Savior has shown us in his choice and institution of his earthly vicar? The Pope is to us in all our conduct what the blessed sacrament is to us in all our adoration. Wow. Let me read that again. The Pope is to us in all our conduct what the blessed sacrament is to us and all our adoration. The mystery of his vicariate is akin to the mystery of the blessed sacrament. The two mysteries are intertwined. Father Faber. So let's use a little more plain, firm language. Catholics who are not papists are traitors. Catholics who are not papists end up being like Judas. They'll betray the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Father Faber goes on, The conclusion to be drawn from all this is of the most momentous importance. It is no less than this. The Pope is an essential part of all Christian piety. It is not a matter which stands apart from the spiritual life, as if the papacy were only the politics of the church. I think some want to think that today. As if an institution belonging to her external life, that's all it is, just, a, just an institution. I think some want to think that too. As if it were just a divinely appointed convenience of ecclesiastical government. 
No, it is a doctrine and a devotion. Now, when the priest says Mass, at the time he mentions the Holy Father's name, he bows his head. It's a devotion. It's a doctrine. It's a foundation. Father Faber goes on. It is an integral part of the blessed Lord's own plan. Consequently, what is done to the Pope for him or against him is done to Jesus himself. Again, what's he saying? Catholics who are not papists or traitors. It's part of our very essence as Catholics to be papists. Father Faber continues. Now, there are many intricacies in these days, many perplexing entanglements of the church and the world. But if we hold fast by this principle, if with a childlike bravery we are all for Jesus, we shall thread our way safely through all labyrinths and never have the unhappiness of finding ourselves either through cowardice or through the prudence of the flesh or through the want of spiritual discernment on the side where Jesus is not. Father Faber, he's saying, if we're devoted to the Pope, Jesus will not easily let us leave his kingdom. He won't let us become traitors. Father Faber continues, devotion to the Pope is an indispensable element in all Christian holiness so that without it, no piety is solid. In every age, it has been an invariable feature of the saints that they have had a keen and sensitive devotion towards the Holy See. Now, we can think of St. Catherine of Siena. She was dealing with some very stubborn pontiffs, but she would always say, my sweet Christ on earth. Maybe we could reword it. My sweet King on earth. Father Faber says we must enter. We must enter. It must be part of our private devotion to enter warmly into the sympathies of the church for her visible head. Or God will not enter into sympathy with us. Yikes. In all ages, as well as in all vocations, grace is given on a certain tacit conditions in times when God allows the church to be assailed in the person of her visible head, which can happen in multiple ways. Let's read that again. In times when God allows the church to be assailed in the person of her visible head, sensitiveness about the Holy See will be found to be an implied condition of all growth in grace. We want our prayers answered. We want to grow in holiness. We need to be sensitive to the papal office. We must be papists. Yet it must be remembered, when we call the Pope the head and king of the church militants, we do not forget that this same Pope, regardless of how great his dignity, intelligence, and other talents may be, is nevertheless only the vicar of Christ the King. It is Christ who is the Pope. He is the bishop, pastor, and priest of the church, of each diocese, of each parish, of each soul. The Pope and those under the Pope are only ambassadors or vicars of the King. He alone is the head of the body. St. Paul is clear in today's lesson. And in all things, he holds the primacy. In another place, in his letter to the Ephesians, St. Paul says, God hath subjected all things under his feet and made him the head of, over all the church, which is his body. Everything depends on Christ the King. Now, due to the limits of time, let us focus on the voice of the king that was mentioned in today's gospel. The voice of the king. It is the head that thinks. It's the head that speaks, not the body. Whatever the church presents as that which must be believed, 
must be His Word, the incarnate Word, the voice of the King. The Pope is only infallible under the condition of His complete dependence upon Jesus, the Teacher, the infallible Christ, the King, the infallible Word, the infallible voice. Now what happens then when Christ's ambassadors, even the Pope himself, speaks a different word from that of the king? God forbid, shame on them. This is possible and has happened before. In 1331, Pope John XXII taught in a series of sermons that the saints do not see God until the last judgment, that they would enter into sort of a hibernation until they got their bodies back at the final judgment and then they could go to heaven and see God. After causing much turmoil, he retracted his false doctrine and indicated he never intended to bind the church. He repented. When a pope speaks with a different voice than that of the king, he does not speak infallibly. He speaks his own opinion, his personal opinion. And once again, shame on him. We can tell the difference by tradition. Whether what is said has a genealogy that can be traced back to the king, to his voice. Furthermore, we can see from the history that such a dissonance, such a cacophony of voices causes what? Confusion, disorientation among the faithful. Under John the 22nd, there were Dominicans against Dominicans. He split the order over the issue. They hear one who is in the place of Christ speaking one voice and they hear the other voice in tradition, in the writings of the saints and the doctors and in their hearts. And there's a difference. They see that the Pope, what he is saying, has no pedigree, no link to the king's word. So St. Paul says... For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? Or when the soldiers hear that trumpet sound that's uncertain, they start discussing and arguing amongst themselves what they heard instead of engaging in battle. What happens? The church militant becomes the church suffering. She enters into a passion. And the Pope is no longer a general but he's watching under him the church suffering. He ushers in a passion. You are surely aware that this is a problem we've been facing for some decades as various ambassadors at all levels contradict what the king has taught and set in place in his church from time immemorial. This problem has been exacerbated over the last few months because the papacy is no longer a visible monarchy. Since there is a retired pope making the papacy look like a representative government. And you know well that the representative governments in our day, well, they're open to unbridled criticism by the people. Thus, not surprisingly, there are many open, unhealthy, inappropriate judgments and criticisms and commentaries being leveled against the Pope. As Father Faber points out, this is a deadly thing to our Catholic piety. But what does the faithful son of the church do? First, he makes sure he has not misunderstood the Pope. Please uh, hit that trumpet again. Thought I heard something different. So he makes sure he gives the Pope a benefit of the doubt and gives him time to make a clarification. Second, he avoids passing any judgment upon the Pope's person. We leave that to the king. To go there is to undermine and eventually destroy our Catholic piety. It is very dangerous. The devil delights 
when we do this. Such behavior in Catholics will end in their becoming traitors, leaving the church militant. Third, after the needed clarifications have been made, the faithful son does not blindly defend every action of the ambassador. That would be an excessive form of clericalism. That would be papalatry. Listen to Melchior Cano, the great Dominican theologian of the Council of Trent. He says, those who blindly and indiscriminately defend every decision of the Supreme Pontiff are the very ones who do most to undermine the authority of the Holy See. They destroy instead of strengthening its foundations. Okay, the faithful son, therefore, faithful son of the church, he seeks to resist the false teaching without touching the person of the Pope. He resists without losing his love and devotion to the papacy. Pope St. Pius X expressed it like this, fight error without touching the individual. We might say, fight error without touching the king, without touching the office, without damaging your piety, without touching the doctrine of the papacy. In 1559, Pope Paul IV declared in a papal bull that this is possible. He said, The Pope is judged by none in this world, but may nonetheless be contradicted or resisted if he be found to have deviated from the faith. Pope Paul IV, 1559. Thus, there is a distinction between judging a Pope and resisting a Pope between loving the papacy and not approving of erroneous opinions of popes and their behavior. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches, quote, there being an imminent danger for the faith, prelates must be questioned even publicly by their subjects, end quote. Listen to his words, questioned, not criticized, not ridiculed, not attacked, not judged, Questioned. This is how the prophet Nathan corrected King David. He questioned him. Current code of canon law. This is canon 212, paragraph 3. 212, paragraph 3. Look it up when you get home. It says that this can be done by the faithful, but with due reverence and respect according to the office and dignity of the prelate being addressed. The papal office has the highest of dignities on earth. Therefore, these corrections must be treated with the greatest care, something few are doing at our time. The Pope is not a president, even if he would like to be one. We have to be papists. Let us not forget what is done to the Pope for him or against him is done to Jesus himself. Let us not forget, devotion to the Pope is an indispensable element in all Christian piety. Therefore, let us not lose our faith and become traitors while trying to defend the faith. Let us remember that what is happening is a test. Let's not flunk it. Let's pass through it. It's a test. This has been done. This has been allowed by the mysterious permission of our King. And if you want it to stop, then pray to have the permission removed. There's the way. I'm going to let Father Faber conclude for us today. There have been many times in the experience of the church when the bark of Peter has seemed to be foundering in the midnight seas. It's dark. There's lots of waves. It's nasty. Where we are. There are pages of history which makes us hold our breath as we read them and hush the palpitations of our hearts even though we know full well that the next page will record the fresh victory which came of the fresh abasement. We are fallen upon one of those evil epochs now. It is hard to bear, but our indignation works not the justice of God. And bitterness gives us no power with Him. 
The blasphemy of the unbeliever may rouse our faith. The faltering of the children of the fold may wring our hearts. But let our sorrow have no bitterness mingled with its sanctity. We must fix our eyes on Jesus and do the double duty which our love of Him now lays upon us. I say double duty. For it is a day when God looks for open professions of the faith. For unbashful proclamations of our allegiance. It is a day also when the sense of our outward helplessness casts us more than ever upon the duty of inward prayer. It makes us get on our knees and pray that those permissions be removed. This is the other duty. The open profession is of little worth without the inward prayer. But I think the inward prayer is almost of less worth without that outward profession. Many virtues grow in secret. But loyalty, loyalty can only thrive in the bare sunshine and upon the open hills. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.